All right, we're gonna move on uh, to Keith, Keith Bell, who is an amazing, has an amazing Facebook page and full, like it's a plethora of information. Thank you so much for joining us, Keith. Oh, we can't hear you. <laughs> Perfect. Ah, can, you can, you hear, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay, great. I'm, I'm very honored and, and proud to be here. I had my, my mic muted. That's okay. I wanted, I wanted to listen and not uh, interrupt. Alex, no. that was a fantastic presentation, and that my heart goes out to all the, all the families here. Yeah, it was like kind of a great intro. Now we can really hit that microbiome, which is why you're here. Um, we're so happy to have you here. I'm just going to give a little intro uh, for everyone listening. So uh, Keith Bell is a citizen scientist particularly interested in gut-brain connection, including gut origin of seizure, underdiagnosed in epilepsy. Published articles include topics such as microbial, excuse me, predisposition, fetal colonization, microbe translocation, and vaccine safety. During the 1980s, he was a UNICEF radio spokesperson in Chicago for annual release of State of the World's Children Report. He believes sanitation is sanity and that microbial, excuse me, microbial balance is an internal and external environmental issue of the highest order. Keith founded the Gut Club in 2016 to create awareness about the importance of intestinal health to personal and environmental health and provide support for treatment and prevention of metabolic disease. In 2018, he published the children's book, I Wonder What It's Like to Be a Raindrop, The Rain-Making Bacteria. We're so happy to have you, Keith. Please take it away. Okay, great. Let me um, start up my slideshow here. Okay, can everyone hear me still? I guess so. Okay, well, the, the focus of what I wanna get across to everyone today is the concept of microbial predisposition and how this is key. Oh, I think I went to, uh, let me try this again. How microbial predisposition is key to what happens in any kind of health crisis, not just autism, but also COVID-19, we're going to talk about. And we're going to uh, discuss what's known as the microbiota gut-brain axis. It used to be known as the gut-brain axis, but that was updated fairly recently to include microbiota. Um, and the picture that you see here is actually the small intestine, it's the third section of small intestine known as the ileum. And this photo was named ileum skyline by the scientist who, who took the photo. And it doesn't include photos of the microbes, though those are too small to, to be seen here. But what you do see are the goblet cells that produce mucus in the uh, ileum. Uh, and below you um, can see just the beginnings of what's known as the Peyer's patches. Those are where the immune cells are born, basically, and, and the beginning of the lymphatic system. So really, I like to think of this as the most important part of the body. In fact, it's an eighth inch um, on the inside and an eighth inch on the outside, and together, that could be construed as the most important quarter inch of the body, maybe even more important than the brain itself, because without health, in this part of the body where there's a reciprocal relationship between microbes and our and host immune response, we wouldn't have proper brain function. We have, uh, as part of the Gut Club, the Gut Club Stool Test Discussion Group on Facebook. It's now about 7,000 people. And the, the goal is for people to post their charts. And we, as a hive mind, interpret the stool test results. And what we're seeing is really obvious dysbiosis. That means an imbalance of microbes. A lot of people think that, you know, we can't really know what constitutes a healthy microbial balance. I, I like to think that uh, you should never poo-poo the poo-poo tests because th it's better than shooting in the dark by far. And we can see what constitutes a healthy microbial balance. One of the things that I like to, to strive is 
protective bacteria. And when we see reduced or absent protective bacteria, and there are certain types uh, that we can talk about, then that's an, a, a red flag. In this chart from a few years ago, I found this one particularly moving because this was a parent of an autistic child where they couldn't really understand, nor could their doctor, the importance of this result showing 46 percent proteobacteria. Uh, hey, hey, kid, I'm sorry. We, we we can only see the, the slide number one, so maybe maybe you can advance with the. Yeah, there you go. Yep. Thank you. Okay. 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 I, I can advance with this. Um, I thought you could see uh, my screen with the slideshow. Uh, all right, we can we can do it this way. So basically, we're, what we're seeing here is high levels of proteobacteria, and this test result allowed the parents of the child to choose FMT. This was a few years ago, before Dr. Adams uh, was doing, his, or or at least publishing his research. So they were pioneers. And lo and behold, the FMT actually did uh, uh, balance flora. And my understanding is that autistic symptoms were, were attenuated. But this level of proteobacteria is quite high. And what this means also is that there are low levels of protective formicutes that are, that are responsible in large part for producing butyrate, uh, maybe the most important of the short chain fatty acids. There are likely low levels of lactobacillus and, and bifidobacteria as well, which would have helped to balance proteobacteria. But also, very importantly, uh, there may be low levels of protective bacteroides. And this is what this next paper talked about. At the end of 2019, I found this paper particularly impactful uh, because it showed that in cesarean section, there were low levels of protective bacteroides. And what the paper was, uh, was getting to is that the reason was use of antibiotics. I happen to be a, a crusader against antibiotics. I like to say you can't kill your way to good health. You have to add life. So in this study, they found low levels of protective bacteroides in cesarean section. And this is a crucial thing because it's also been found that uh, that C-section does carry a, a higher risk in, in autism. The same is true for obesity, by the way. But in C-section delivery, we're seeing higher levels of risk in having an autistic child perhaps due to the, you know, the antibiotics that are used that are leveling protective bacteroides. And, you know, this paper was actually, uh, I don't, let's see, this is March of 2020. Uh, and basically what we're seeing here also is a focus on reduced bacteroides as the signature um, in gut mic microbiota of ASD. So, I like to place a lot of emphasis on, on bacteroides. Okay. Last year in January, I had the opportunity to attend really uh, as, a matter, as a member of the press, uh, probably the most important microbiome conference maybe on the globe. Uh, it takes place in Miami called the Miami Winter Symposium. And this is a video of an interview I had opportunity to do with Dr. Martin Blazer, who is a very important uh, person in the field of microbiome. He wrote a book called Missing Microbes, which is probably the most important book for the general public about, about microbes and, and, uh, and microbiome. And we talked about this paper. Uh, at the time, he wasn't even aware of it, uh, it seems. But his wife does a lot of the work on C-section and, um, and using vaginal gauze to replenish the microbes that are missing in C-section birth. More recently, there are even, uh, there's even study about using the poop of the mom and taking a small amount and, and replenishing those microbiomes orally with the, with the newborn.
this paper came out uh, just last just just last month, um, and they're they're showing that lactobacillus was able to rescue social deficits, uh, and that's a fascinating thing. They they found that uh, hyperactivity was uh, was not altered, so they they chalked that one up to genes. But I think hyperactivity can also be seen uh, from a microbial standpoint. And, and when it comes to um, social deficits, earlier research back in 2016 did show that uh, actually oxytocin receptors were raised in the brain using this, this uh, same type of, the same strain of lactobacillus, uh, lactobacillus ruteri. And it's fascinating to consider how this gut-brain axis uh, uh, likely through other research, uh, it seems to be that through the vagus nerve, the lactobacillus were able to raise oxytocin receptors in the brain, and how this can raise empathy and and social interaction, uh, but also oxytocin is crucial for immune response. So I put a lot of weight on, on lactobacillus when looking at stool testing, and it just so happens to be reduced or absent in a lot of people these days. Uh, so. You know, actually, this is the time of year when, you know, religion plays a significant role. And of course, fasting in the studies uh, on fasting and including intermittent fasting has, have been shown to raise lactobacillus. Maybe these are the roots for the religious uh, use of fasting and actually the result being raised oxytocin uh, due to a flora shift. We'll also talk about this related to diet. So in 2020, we continued our gut-brain epilepsy project, and we still are, uh, because there, I'm sorry, not gut-brain epilepsy project, our microbiome vaccine safety project. Uh, this is something that I consider the teeth of the gut club, and along with the gut-brain epilepsy project. The, the microbiome vaccine safety project really exemplifies microbial predisposition because it's about micro microbes present at the time of vaccination that lead to an immune response that can cause damage, including brain, uh, brain damage. So, you know, this, this, this factor of microbial predisposition plays a key role in, in my whole thought process. And, uh, you know, we, you know, we're sad to see that there isn't a single publication yet that focuses on this dynamic with respect to vaccine safety. Why is there, there, there must be research out there that's gone unpublished because we can't be so smart to think that we're the only ones that have considered this dynamic. I've actually been publishing papers about it since 2014. Here's one from 2015. Uh, so I would have hoped that we've inspired uh, science to do some research our co-author, by the way, on this paper um, that um, has been published finally in 2018 um, does have her own vaccine lab, and she's willing to, to do the first research, which has been designed. We just need the funding to make it happen. Actually, her, her first attempt at funding uh, her lab for this research was declined. Unbelievably. I also uh, published a paper at the end of 2015 about microbe translocation and colonization in the womb, because the womb is not sterile, it's known. Yet there's still some debate about whether or not there are microbes in the womb. I think it's time to jump off the fence uh, and consider how this really does happen in the womb. Here, here's some vaccine safety research that was published at the end of 2019, September 2019. It's, it's really quite a Gosh, it's, it seems like 10 years ago, right before the pandemic. But here we see antibiotics skewing immune response so that there, you know, there was vaccine failure, basically. The inflammation that took place based on gut dysbiosis caused the vaccines not to work. Um, but they skipped over entirely the idea that there could be adverse vaccine reaction. We're focusing on Th17 in gut dysbiosis and how 
uh, lipopolysaccharides and gram-negative bacteria can skew the immune response, leading to IL-17 uh, cells being born, and you know, as a, as the result of Th17, and how this increases neutrophil activity, which can then shift flora even further in the in, in the wrong direction. So we have a a dynamic taking place of microbial predisposition that skews immune response, which then skews microbe balance even even further in the wrong direction. And how that takes place in 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 the womb, even. I mean, here we see how IL-17 is implicated in neurotypical development uh, when it's reduced, when when Th Th17 is reduced, but then when it's raised due to microbial regulation of this immune response, we can have issues of brain development in the womb. This is a particular particularly emotional uh, piece of information here that is related, published 2016. They didn't uh, take microbes into account, but what they're showing is in the womb, IL-17 increasing cortical malformation based on immune activation in the mother. So these things take place both inside and outside of the womb. You can have perhaps a very healthy uh, child uh, and then, you know, vaccinated, that which causes an, an immune response that leads to a gut-brain axis injury. And this includes racial differences as well. You know, in minorities, for example, you know, it's in, even by the CDC's own acknowledgement, young uh, black boys are at increased risk of MMR um, damage, resulting in in autism. What they're not considering are racial differences in microbiota, which according to the uh, collection of literature that I've been compiling over the years, there's a natural difference. And that difference is higher levels of gram-negative bacteria. So it's been acknowledged finally at the end of 2019, November 29th, 2019, that gut microbiota affect vaccination to the point that it can result in what's called inflammaging. And they talked about this related to the elderly and how vaccine vaccines may cause an adverse reaction in the elderly. They didn't talk about children in this report, but inflammaging is not just about the elderly. This is a, a, something we started just last year about COVID-19, about how gut dysbiosis can lead to an immune response which damages the lungs. This was this was early on in the in the pandemic. Of course, now we know it's not just about the lungs; it's about all organs, including the brain. You know, here we see obese people are are at more risk of COVID-19. You know, it's it's the obese, diabetics, the elderly, and minorities that are that are most at risk uh, in severe COVID symptoms. And based on our research, we know that lipopolysaccharides bind with the virus, so is SARS-CoV-2. We know that proteobacteria bind with, with SARS-CoV-2. And we also know that SARS-CoV-2 virus binds with TLR4, which is a receptor that regulates immune response. And largely uh, about how lipopolysaccharides interact with that receptor. So we can see a microbial predisposition to severe COVID-19, whereas most people by far survive it and have a, an immune response that's regulated by a, he a healthy microbial balance. So for most people, it hasn't been an issue. Here's part of our Ad Life campaign here. We're talking about kefir grains. And this is a traditional way of making kefir, which has a very broad uh, number of microbes. However, if you if you ferment kefir for 48 hours or more, you you have a, a product that's lactobacillus dominant. It may still even include healthy um, protective bacteroides. It's quite a broad range, but this paper was shown that um, kefir will protect 
against viral infection, and they suggest that it be used in COVID-19. Another um, nice uh, 2020, October 2020 graphic showing that healthy microbes, um, a healthy microbial balance leads to an effective immune response, whereas dysbiosis leads to a failed immune response and COVID-19 symptoms. You know, here's here's a, the basic thing here is about how the immune response dictated by microbes or regulated by, by microbes and heavily impacted by microbes can lead to an immune response that can further cause imbalance. And this is about plasma blasts. Let's talk a bit about diet. This paper goes back to 2004 and how, how the ketogenic diet could actually control seizures based on how the diet shifts amino acid levels. Well, it's, it's not so well known that amino acid levels are regulated by microbes. They make them and break them. So this one talks about tryptophan. Uh, Alex did a, a very nice job talking about tryptophan metabolism. That's also been my focus for a number of years. And I'm, st I'm still trying to grasp it. It's so important because it's the precursor of the neurotransmitters, serotonin and melatonin, but also niacin. And so tryptophan is a, is a big deal. What's not necessarily factored is how microbes have the ability to degrade tryptophan and can cause deficiency, especially, it seems, the gram-negative bacteria, including uh, the bacteroides. So here we have a mechanism for controlling epilepsy by shifting flora. And there are a number of papers that have been published. This is a most recent one. It's a critical review from 2020, um, November of 2020, where they're talking about how FMT and the ketogenic diet shifted flora to raise short-chain uh, short uh, fatty acids like butyrate in particular, raise GABA. Uh, and this is all about flora shift and how it affects the brain. In fact, my, you know, aside from, you know, always having an interest in child health as a former UNICEF spokesperson in the 1980s, um, you know, I, I've also been interested in, in the environment. But I have to say that um, a lot of my inspiration for studying the gut-brain axis was our family dog suffering a seizure disorder and how when we treated her gut, not just her brain, we were able to control that. My heart goes out to all the families suffering, um, you know, with their children because it, what I experienced and the, the stress that we had really pales in comparison. And I can't imagine um, going through that with a child, leave alone what we experienced with a dog. Okay, we're, we're coming around the bend here, Enrique. Um, Enrique has done a great job focusing on the study with respect to uh, aspergillus and how fungi um, can lead to brain problems. Well, it just so happens that aspergillus are also inhibited by lactobacillus. And perhaps the people that are working with this construct using Sporinox might also want to raise their, their uh, their children's lactobacilli because you know it you know it will also affect tryptophan metabolism. This is a, a paper um, that talks about that that um, is just uh, from this year, January of, of 2021. And the the Aspergillus uh, fumigatus that was that has been focused on um, in Enrique's Enrique's uh, excellent work with Dr. Baker and and um, and uh, Dr. Shaw. So uh, basically, lactobacillus have the ability to raise IL-22, which is an immune response that then controls fungi. I used to think that lactobacillus were directly, you know, almost consuming yeast, but it doesn't work that way. You have to dig a little bit deeper to see how microbes regulate the immune response, which allow the immune system to then control the offending microbe. We're, we're producing kefir grains at the Gut Club that have been developed in France using grains that are, that are 
um, from all over the world and also protective strains of, of well-researched lactobacillus, bifidobacteria, and protective yeasts. We also have a, you know, a hypothesis that may appear controversial, but there is some science backing it up that as far as FMT is concerned, breastfed baby poop may be the most untapped medicine on earth. Uh, it, it could be a very important um, way of healing for a number of reasons that we discuss on uh, in this uh, page on thegutclub.org. You can check it out. So let's light it up ochre. Breastfed baby poop. Should you use vancomycin or another antibiotic before FMT? A lot of people think have uh, and have thought through the last several years that vancomycin is reducing clostridia, and when you stop using it, it's growing back. Well, I, that's not the way I've thought about it for a number of years. Vancomycin is also known to cause our mitochondria, which were thought to once be bacteria themselves. They evolved to become part of our human cell and uh, the mammalian cell. Uh, but vancomycin actually causes mitochondria to reduce ROS, reactive oxygen species, which can then balance flora, the intracellular microbiota in the cell that are producing toxins that cause mitochondrial dysfunction. And we're offering a microbiome balancing private consultation where the goal is to help people understand their stool test results and expand uh, tool, your toolbox toward balance. These things can be shifted in the right direction. Uh, lastly, we have on Patreon our Microbiome Vaccine Safety Project, which isn't gaining a lot of steam uh, yet because people, I think, are you know have really been given quite a nice, uh, uh, quite a nice education about the immune system based on the last year's pandemic, and I think this uh, construct is really you know quite it's more amenable in, in the minds of, of, of people that microbes can actually uh, run the show. So we'd like to make a film about it. If anyone would be interested in becoming a, our executive producer, that would be fantastic. Please contact us. That's about it. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to be here. Thank you so much. That was wonderful, Keith. Thank you.